In this tutorial we're going to look at some more trig functions in the advanced level of Autograph, uh, looking at uh, inverse trig functions and also some calculus. So first of all the concept of an inverse is quite interesting with trig functions. Here we have uh, y equals sine x and here we have x equals sine y which at first thought might be an inverse function but clearly it isn't because it fails what I call the vertical line test. Uh, because uh, if it is a genuine inverse, there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the inverse function and the parent. A single value of x must produce a single value of y on the inverse. It doesn't do that. Um, but this function here is what happens if you actually enter y equals sine to the minus 1 of x. So that is the inverse function. So how does all that happen? New page. Right-click, enter equation, y equals sine x. Press the red tick to get nice scales. Now, there is actually a function here to reflect in the line y equals x, uh, which, if it is going to have an inverse, then that would be a good starting point. So we'll, we'll try that see what happens. So that's going to simply swap over x and y. So what was y equals sine x is now x equals sine y. Let's just zoom out a tiny bit and see what's happening here. Oh, yes. Um, so to put the vertical line on, what I do is put a line, put a point on the original parent graph and then ask for a vertical line and that's quite a nice way of, of saying well for a given value of x is the value of y unique and it is not because clearly it's very multi-valued so let's uh, ask the computer now to draw y equals sine to minus 1 of x now there's a minus 1 button here which is quite handy and x follows and you click OK now the slow plot at the moment means that there's nothing here, there's no function that exists but uh, if we just pause for a second, what's going to happen as it, as it hits here it has to decide which bit of this is going to be the inverse function and the standard convention is that from minus pi by 2 to plus pi by 2, let's have a look now it's not very easy to see that so I'm going to double click on this and draw options and make it nice and fat Uh, personally, whenever I say sine to the minus 1 of x, I actually sort of think to myself the angle whose sine is x. And so, in fact, we have angles up this axis as well. Um, if you ask the red tick to take care of this, it will put angles up the y-axis, and there we have the angles. But we've also got angles on the other axis as well, so it's, um, there's quite a bit of fiddling around to do there. But uh, that's one way of looking at inverse trig functions. Now, when it comes to... Um, some calculus and trig. Let's just draw the parent again, y equals sine x. So we seem to start off with that and red tick. So if we put a point anywhere on it and right click do a tangent, we can start looking at the gradient function from first principles. It's clearly zero there, so we can put a zero here. And as it moves to the right, I can use the arrow keys for this. As it moves along to the right, so you can see that the gradient becomes something quite interesting there that looks pretty much like y equals x, but we can actually read off down here what the equation of the tangent is, it's been calculated for us, y equals x. So that's definitely a gradient of 1. And then we have a gradient of 0. So you can see it's quite nice to build it up slowly uh, from first principles. But we also have this function here, which is the gradient function, which, when plotted slowly, uh, does exactly what I've just done, but it gives you the results as well. It pauses at all the key moments. There's our point of inflection. The tangent's coming inside, in one side and out the other. And you can release that to get the next section. Now, these are just the same techniques as you do with um, other quadratics and cubics when you're introducing the calculus. And so what graph is this? And uh, you invite uh, suggestions and of course y equals cos x is the one but it's really nice to see it now drawing right on top of the graph that's been achieved that way. This process goes on of course you can do the gradient of the gradient
and then you can do the gradient of that and so on. So you, th these go around in a cycle. After a little experience they realize that uh, after you've done four you're back to the start again. Now we're back to sine x. Then you might be introducing the chain rule. So let's have a look at y equals sine of bx. Now bx is just going to take an initial value of b of 1, so it's just going to be y equals sine x. And if we do the gradient function of that, uh, you will find that you get that. So now the constant controller kicks in. We can change b. Ah, now we discovered uh, in an earlier tutorial that uh, when b goes from 1 to 2, the sine wave, instead of taking 2 pi to complete its cycle, will complete the whole cycle in pi, which means there's a lot more change to the gradient going on. Uh, the gradient is steeper and it's changing quicker. Now, since the blue line represents how fast the red one is changing, that is definitely going to go up because it's a higher value. So if we just take it step by step, we're just going to increase b a little bit and see that on the way it goes to 2, there we have it's now completing a complete cycle in pi radians and the first derivative also completes it in the, so it's on the same frequency but it's double the value, which is quite a nice way of showing that the differential of sine of bx is b times the cosine of bx. Finally, it might be quite nice to have a look at some trig in 3D. So I'm just going to uh, right-click, enter an equation. Let's do z equals a sine x cos y and invite students to think about what that might look like. Well, if you think of this as um, keeping x constant, for example, then z is the cos of y. So for all the for x constants, it's going to be um, a nice curvy y sine wave along the y-axis. Then if you keep y constant, uh, y equals sine x, so it's going to be a curvy line on the x-axis for constant y. So um, those with really good imagination will puzzle out that it's going to look a bit like a ski slope, the sort of ski slope that uh, only very proficient skiers like to go down, and the constant controller will happily make it steeper if they want a bit more of a challenge. Then you might say, well, how do we define slope or steepness in uh, uh, in 3D, apart from the general sort of fear factor of being on a slope this steep? Is there some mathematical way of doing it? Well, one way to do it is to put a normal unit vector on there and also to put a tangent plane and a small one. Because if a, if a tangent determines how steep a line is in 2D, then a plane will do the same thing in 3D, and there it is. So this is quite a nice way of showing that in order to get to the next peak um, we can change x and quite independently we can change y. So between those two variables it should be possible to reach the top of that peak by independently making x the maximum and y the maximum and that of course is the basic principle of bivariate calculus in 3D. But a nice way to finish off this little tutorial.